We're going to look at the first question tonight that comes from John chapter 14 and verse 28. And the question is, according to John chapter 14, verse 28, the scripture said, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, you would, have, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Isn't Jesus separate from the Father? Well, I want to begin this tonight by reading to you again something I read on the first night of this study, I want to begin reading from the Athanasian Creed. If you want to know what the doctrine of the Trinity is, you have to know the Athanasian Creed. And it says, and I quote, Whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, and the Holy Ghost is uncreated. The Father is incomprehensible, the Son is incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost is incomprehensible. The Father is eternal, and the Son is eternal, and the Holy Ghost is eternal. Let me stop there briefly and tell you that automatically you're thinking, if we stop there and read no more, you think that we have described three separate individual gods, each having different personalities, and yet the writers of this doctrine, this Athanasian Creed, they know you're confused by now. And they now foresee or anticipate your questions and so they answer them. They say the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, and the Holy Ghost is eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there are not three uncreateds, nor three incomprehensibles, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Ghost is almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, and the Son is Lord, and the Holy Ghost is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghost, and in this Trinity, none is before or after the other. None is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. Therefore, he that will be saved must think on the Trinity. I told you before that this is where they try to convince you that 2 plus 2 no longer equals 4. But the rules change for this. This is where they're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. This is where they try a key that doesn't fit the door. But they want you to accept that by faith. Now, for the Trinitarians, this scripture, John 14, 28, I would think they would never bring it up because I would think for them it would be a nightmare. For Jesus said, I go to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. If they're all co-equal and co-eternal, and they all have equal power and they have equal position, if all of them are called almighty, then what happens to the equality of God or the persons in the Godhead if one of them is speaking from an inferior position? If the Son is saying, my Father is greater than I. If Jesus is an 8 on a scale from 1 to 10 and his Father is greater, we would assume he might be a 10. But in Trinitarian thinking, that's not the way you do it. I would think this would be a very difficult thing for them to, to uh, explain, but I'm going to show you how they explain it first. The Trinitarians offer answer this question by saying, I, I, I want to add here, apparently without thinking first, 
they say that they are equal in essence, but not equal in role. For the father is greater than in role than the son. Well, that would destroy your co-equality. You can't have both ways. You can't be equal and inferior at the same time. I'm telling you folks, this is a confusion that was made up. We said before, this is a product of pagan mythology, Grecian philosophy. It is not taught in the scripture. According to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, in him, speaking of the man Christ Jesus, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We believe that there was one body and there was one spirit and that, that God, the ultimate almighty God, dwelt in one man and that was the man Christ Jesus. We don't believe in separating the two of them as two separate deities, but we separate them as body and spirit. You can't divide God. You can't divide God into three co-equal parts. He was just one. And Colossians said that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in that one body. The Greek word for fullness is the sum total, meaning when you add it all up, you just get Jesus. Vine's Expository Dictionary said, according to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, in him dwelleth the completeness of God in his being. And yet the Trinitarians view this co-equality in the Godhead or these three co-equal parts, each one making up one-third of what God was. So when you say in the beginning God said, they're thinking that God is the three persons, so they're really speaking in kind of a trio. In three-part harmony, I guess. They're all speaking together in this harmony, and that's not what the Scripture said. And since they've got God divided up into three co-equal parts, they're constantly communicating with each other in Trinitarian doctrine, then because of that, you never have a place where he is totally God by himself. It doesn't matter where he speaks, if he speaks as the Father or the Son or the Holy Ghost, he's only speaking as one-third of the team. But the Bible said in him, in that man Christ Jesus, dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All that God was, all that he was ever going to be, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in that man bodily. In fact, it's been said that there's only three choices you can have with the Godhead. You either believe that the sum total of God was in Christ or you believe the Godhead was made up of three persons, each one represent, representing one-third of God or you believe that there were three gods and that's tritheism. According to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, in him the man Christ Jesus dwelt the sum total of the Godhead bodily. The Old Testament, they didn't know who he was, but they longed to know his name, but it was called a secret in the Old Testament. Jacob, we talked about a week or two ago, that he desired to know the name in Genesis 32 and 29. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. He said, Jacob, you know I'm not going to tell you my name. Stop fooling around, Jacob. You know that's not for you. That's not for this generation. Manoah, who was the son of Samson, he also wanted to know the name. In Judges 13, 18, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou after my name, seeing it is a secret? You're not going to wrestle with him and you're not going to probe around with him and think he's going to let it slip. The name was not known to them. It was a secret. But then when Isaiah came on the scene in chapter 7, he said, I may not know his name, but I know they're going to call him the El Gabor. They're going to call him the Mighty God. And I know they're going to call him Emmanuel, which according to Matthew 1.23 was God with us. Isaiah 7.14 said, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call him his name Emmanuel not junior Jehovah not a junior partner in creation not a second person not a mere son but God with us whatever that revelation was that God gave to Isaiah there must have been chill bumps that ran all up and down Isaiah's backbone 
He must have trembled and shook in his shoes when he penned the words of chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the El Gabor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then that day must have shook all time and eternity. Uh, when time stood still, as that secret name was breathed, uh, for the, that sound reached human ears for the first time. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from from their sins. It was not a secret any longer. The one that was going to bring redemption and salvation, it was the man Christ Jesus. He was going to shed his own blood so we could have life, and it was the God in him that raised him from the dead. He was more than just a man. In fact, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 said, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. How much power? All power. Not just in the earth, but in heaven and in the earth. John 3, 34 said he was given the Spirit of God without measure. There was no restriction to the amount that was put in that body because all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. Peter, being full of the Holy Ghost, proclaimed in Acts 4 and 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Titus 2, 13 said, Looking for that blessed hope and the glory appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He was both God and Savior. He was both human and divine. He was both body and spirit all wrapped up together. He was both the Son and El Gabor, the Almighty God. He was a man, but he was the everlasting Father that spoke all things into existence. The Father was God, and that man was God because he had God dwelling inside of him. The God that was in him was greater than the man. Somebody said, in fact, we covered it last week. Who did Jesus pray to? He prayed to God. Who do you pray to when you pray? Well, God dwelled in him. Sure he did, but he dwells in you. You're not talking to yourself when you pray. Amen. Jesus had the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him. But when he said, my father is greater than I. He was talking about the superiority of the deity over the flesh. This next question is the big one. In fact, it was our focus for tonight. According to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, are there not three witnesses in heaven? Well, I want you to turn to this passage of Scripture because I want you to make a couple notations here. And I'm going to just tell you right up front, we're going to cover this one in some, in some detail tonight. I want to make sure I cover it in both perspectives. I want to give you two ways to look at this. First of all, we're going to look at it from the historical point of view, and then we'll tell you how to answer it. In 1 John chapter 5, not St. John, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. Everybody have it? Say Amen. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now I want you to take a pen or a pencil, whatever you have, and I want you to do a little parenthesis here. Look, go back to verse number 7. For there are three that bear record. After the word record, I want you to put the first line of that parenthesis. A parenthesis is like a C, a big C. Bear record. Put parenthesis there and then go down to verse number 8. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. After the word earth, put the other parenthesis, joining that uh, one uh, conjunction between those two verses. Now, I want to read to you from, that's important, I want to read to you from Albert Barnes, his New Testament commentary, which Albert Barnes is a Trinitarian. Wouldn't do you any good, uh, do any of us any good for me to quote from some Pentecostal preacher because folks wouldn't accept that. But this is from a Trinitarian, 
Albert Barnes, New Testament commentary, and I quote, There is no passage of the New Testament which has given rise to so much discussion in regard to its genuineness as this. The supposed importance of the verse in its bearing on the doctrine of the Trinity has contributed to this and has given to the discussion a degree of consequence which has pertained to the examination of the genuineness of no other passage of the New Testament. The portion of the passage in 1 John 5, verses 7 and 8, whose genuineness is disputed, is included in brackets in the following quotation. As it stands in the common editions of the New Testament. The brackets are what I just told you to outline. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Therefore, if the disputed passage therefore be omitted as spurious, the whole passage will read, For there are three that bear record, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. The reason which seems to me to prove that the passage included in brackets is spurious and should not be regarded as part of the inspired writings are briefly as follows. Now, the word spurious there, it means fake, false, counterfeit. It means a forgery. It means artificial, invalid, illogical. And he said here that this that's included in the brackets is spurious, should not be regarded as part of the inspired writings. The reason for that is as follows. Reason one, he said it is wanting in all, early, all of the early Greek manuscripts. For it is found in no Greek manuscript written before the 16th century. Indeed, it is found in only two Greek manuscripts of any age. One written at the beginning of the 16th century and the other is a mere transcript of the text. It was taken partly from the third edition of Stephen's New Testament. The second reason why he considers it to be spurious and should not be regarded as part of the inspired writings, he says it is never quoted by the Greek fathers in their, con in their controversies on the doctrine of the Trinity. A passage would be so, which would be so much in point and which could not have failed to be quoted if it were genuine. And it is not referred to by the Latin fathers until the end of the 5th century. So if the passage were believed to be genuine, in fact, if it were known at all to be in existence and to have had any probability in his favor, it is incredible that in all the controversies which occurred in regard to the divine nature and in all of the efforts to divine the doctrine of the Trinity, this passage should never have been or should have never been referred to, but it never was. For it must be plain to anyone who examines the subject with an unbiased mind. Reason number three, the argument against the passage from the external proof is confirmed by internal evidence, which makes it more certain that it cannot be genuine. Reason number four, it does not contribute to advance what the apostle is saying, but breaks the thread of his argument entirely. He is speaking of certain things which bear witness to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, certain things that were well known to those to whom he was writing, the spirit and the water and the blood. And how does it contribute to strengthen the force of this to say that in heaven there are three that bear witness, three not before referred to, and having no connection with the matter under consideration. Reason number five, the language is not such as John would use. He does indeed elsewhere use the term logos or word, but it is never used in this form. The father and the word, that is the terms father and word, were never used by him or by any of the other sacred writers as correlative. The word son is the term which is correlative to the father in every other place used by John as well as by the other sacred writers. And in the gospel of John, the correlative of the term logos or word with John is not the father but God.
Reason six, without this passage, the sense of the argument is clear and appropriate. There are three, says John, which bear witness that Jesus is the Messiah. It is affirmed that their testimony goes to one point and then is harmonious. But then to say that there are other witnesses elsewhere and then to say that they are one contributes nothing to illustrate the nature of the testimony of these three, the water and the blood and the spirit. For either the apostles is telling us that there are three witnesses or there's just one. Reason number seven. The passage now omitted in the best editions of the Greek New Testament is regarded as spurious by the skilled critics. On the whole, therefore, the evidence seems to me to be clear that this passage is not a genuine portion of the inspired writings and should not be appealed to as proof, proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. End of quote. I've told you before that I I hate when we have to go back and tell somebody that this is not in the original. But that portion of scripture is absolutely not in the original. But then the question of how did it get in the New Testament? Albert Albert Barnes gives a a, uh, explanation to that. He said, and I quote, It is easy to imagine how the passage found its place in the New Testament. It was at first written perhaps in the margin of some Latin manuscript as an expression of the belief of the writer of what he believed was true in heaven as well on the earth. And with no more attention to deceive than we have when we make a marginal note in a book, some some transcriber, however, may have copied it into the body of the text, perhaps with a sincere belief that it was a genuine passage. It was omitted in this case by accident and then it became too important a passage in the argument for the doctrine of the Trinity ever to be displaced but but by the most clear critical evidence. It was therefore rendered into Greek and inserted in one Greek manuscript of the 16th century while it was wanting or missing in all other early manuscripts. I only quote from him tonight in this particular context because I feel like he had the best arguments of all But all of the commentaries that I looked at on this passage all tell that that portion is spurious. Adam Clark's commentary said, There are 112 known manuscripts, and this verse likely is not genuine because it is missing from every known manuscript. Adam Clark also said, just like Albert Barnes, that the words between the brackets are not in the original 112 manuscripts. The Trinity College in Dublin is the only place a copy exists with these extra words added in the 16th century. And the Vatican Library has one from the 15th century. He goes on to say that it was the adding of those words that have contributed to the many years of contradiction and confusion in this text. Because they added these words, it has now left the entire text suspect. It was not in the original. And so anybody that knows anything really about the doctrine of the Trinity, they will never challenge you with that verse. But if they do, this is the way you answer that. Look at this. You don't have to go anywhere else to show them the confusion of the text. Go back to 1 John chapter 5, verse number 6. Let's just jump up a verse there. Verse number 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now if you read this portion of the Scripture that already sets the thread for the witnesses that he's talking about, which was the blood and the water and the Spirit, and then you read this without the addition, for there are three that bear record the spirit and the water and the blood and these three agree in one verse 9 if we receive the witness of men the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his son I want you to notice in this text that the spirit is mentioned here both as a witness in heaven and on the earth so you've got one witness that's in two different places So now you don't have the six witnesses, which would be three that would witness in heaven and three that would witness in the earth, but now you only have five. So the scripture itself is written wrong just in that context. And then why in the world would the son be a witness to himself? I want you to look at something else here. 
Why would there be a need for a witness in heaven? That's why it was spurious. Because there was no need for a witness in heaven. Was there anybody in heaven that doubted that Jesus was the Messiah? Was there anybody that wondered if this was the man? That's not what John was saying here because John did not write that. There was no doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. And according to this, that the Trinitarians believed that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were witnesses on the earth. But if they were witnesses on the earth, then you got five witnesses on the earth and nobody's in heaven. The scripture, in the way it's written, is absurd. The son was not a witness to himself. There was a witness. There was a witness, and the witness was the blood, the spirit, and the water. When the scripture said that the spirit testified, or it bears witness, it goes on to say that it was because the spirit is truth. God was the spirit that gave testimony that Jesus was the Messiah. How did he do that? He did that by Moses and all the prophets. He did that by John the Baptist and all the apostles. He did that by all the writings of the New Testament and against that testimony there's no dispute, there's no quarrel, there's no rebuttal and there's no exception. Why? Because the Spirit is truth and God was the God that, or the Spirit that they were talking about and in God there was no variance. He was that truth. Now notice verse 6 again. This is he that came by water and blood. Jesus was manifest to be the Son of God and the promised Messiah by water, meaning by his baptism. John chapter 1, verse 33. John said, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. When the Spirit of God descended upon him, there was a voice from heaven that came and said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. John knew for sure because the Spirit bore witness. Not everybody heard that voice. Not everybody saw it. But the Spirit bore witness that this man was the Christ. Verse 6 also said that Jesus came by blood. He was not only coming to shed his blood for himself or for the sins of the whole world, but in accordance with the Jewish law. The prophets had written concerning him that it was his blood that must be shed. And the apostle said that the Spirit is witness to this. He didn't just come by water. He was not just baptized, but he also came by blood. He was the sacrifice for all all sin without which the world could not be saved it was because of that body that God made that we have redemption through his blood it was because he sacrificed himself that atonement was made by water and by blood and the spirit of God stood to testify at the baptism that he was in fact the son of God I've said repetitive repetitively over this study that Jesus was not God the Son. He was the Son of God. Amen. The same Spirit that spoke in the Old Testament to the prophets, it witnessed or testified that this man was to die a cruel death, a sacrificial death, because God was the Spirit of of truth and that's the way God could speak something in the past as though it had already happened Moses was a type of Christ Moses came by water and all Israel was baptized the scripture said unto him in the cloud and in the sea Aaron was also a type of Christ he came by blood he entered into the holies of holies with the blood of the atonement so he could make atonement for all uh, of the sins of Israel so Moses he initiated the covenant of Israel or the covenant of God with Israel by bringing them under the cloud and through the water. Moses or Aaron confirmed the covenant by the shedding of blood. He sprinkled part upon them and part before the Lord in the holies of holies. Moses came only by water. Aaron only by blood. Both were types. But Jesus came. He came both by water and by blood. Not just typically, but literally in reality. He came not with the authority of another, but with the authority of himself because it was God. God in Christ that reconciled the world to himself. He paid the sin debt. He wasn't forced to go. It was a choice. That was the reason that he came for. Now, in John chapter 15, 
Verse 26 and 27. When the Comforter is come, the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth forth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And he also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Now this is a real parallel text that John was talking about. When he was talking about the witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. In John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 5 verse 8. John chapter 19 verse 34 said, St. John 1934, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he, that he saith true that ye might believe. Do you realize that no other gospel writer recorded this event? Only John. Why? Because John and six, John one and six said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. It was John the Baptist, and the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through John, through him, might believe. Not by water only, but by water and blood. There were three that bear witness: the Spirit, that was that voice from heaven, and the water, that was the baptism, and the blood, the sacrifice that he offered on the altar. In fact, the Lord said after at the baptism. Thou art my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He was dwelling in him. God had a body now for the first time and he liked the way it felt. He zipped it up and said, I like the way it fits. In whom I'm well pleased. He wasn't saying I'm real proud of my boy. I'm so proud of my son. John chapter 1 verse 5. This is how it was written in the original. This is he that came by water and blood. Verse 6. Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men or man, the witness of God is greater. There's not a controversy there. The controversy came from the adding of a portion of text that was never intended to be there. There was not three people up there standing to bear witness and three more in the earth standing to bear witness. There was just one God and he was in the man Christ Jesus. Next question, who came in the flesh, Jesus or God? This comes from 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God and this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it is that it should come and even now already is in the world so who came in the flesh that's not difficult God came in the flesh and what was his name Hebrews 1 and 4 said he inherited it being made so much better than the angels he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they meaning he received it from another in fact that the the commentary on that said he received it from another like the passing of an heirloom from a previous owner. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27 all things Jesus said are delivered unto me of my father and no man knoweth the son but the father neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he to whomsoever the son will reveal him. He got everything by inheritance even his name. I think the greater question there was if the son knows the father and the father knows the son and nobody can know the son except the father and nobody can know the father except the son, where is the Holy Ghost in all of that? Does he know anybody? I said before, he's this, always this photographer standing back here in the background like at the Grand Canyon. Somebody's got to take the pictures and, and he just lets the father and son do their father and son trips and they go and they do whatever they're going to do and move around, go shopping and, and whatever and he's just taking the pictures, getting the whole thing recorded. He's never in any of the pictures. He's always back there in the background somewhere. I want to tell you this tonight, folks. At the end of this, of this series, we deny the doctrine of the Trinity because it divides the Godhead into three parts, each being one-third God. We reject the doctrine of the Trinity because it denies the extent of the deity that was in Christ. They have one-third of God in him. What they have is just one person in the Godhead that has, or one, one third of God is in that man. We don't believe that. We believe all the fullness of the Godhead 
dwelt in him bodily. We reject the doctrine of the Trinity. First Corinthians or Second Corinthians five nineteen tells us it was God, God, God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was not one of the three. It was God. Who was God? First Corinthians chapter eight verse six said there was one God, the Father. That's who it was. It was God, and He was the Father of all things. So when the Bible talks about God in Christ, it was the guy was God, the Father that was in Christ. He was reconciling the world to Himself, and all of God was in Christ. If not, then His death did not reconcile us to all deity, only to one third of deity, and that's not what the scripture said. The doctrine of the Trinity denies the obvious nature, the dual nature of Jesus Christ. He was one body and he was one spirit. It took the body to bring redemption, but it took the God that was in him to raise him from the dead and purchase our salvation. I want to tell you that we deny the doctrine of the Trinity because it has turned of this unity in, the, in God, this unity in this man, this body and this spirit. They have turned that into some council or some committee and the scripture never taught that. There was only one God from the beginning. More than almost 8,000 times the Bible said that God was one. He was by himself. And because of that, we know he's still one. He's not divided. Uh, God had counsel, but not counselors. He counseled with his own will. And that one God can do everything all by himself. We deny the doctrine of the Trinity because they have God the Son dying on a cross and God never died. The man Christ Jesus died. God is a spirit. There's no weapon that can kill God. You can't kill deity. Deity has never died. It was the man Christ Jesus that died. According to the Trinity, Matthew 1.20, Luke chapter 1 uh, verse 35, if you are a Trinitarian, then you have both two fathers of Christ. You have the Holy Ghost and the Father fathering that child. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, God was the Father of the Son. Philippians 1 and 19 speaks of the Spirit of Jesus. John 4, 24 speaks of God being a Spirit. Luke 1, 35, Acts 2 and 4 tells us that the Holy Ghost was the Spirit. Ephesians 4 and 4 tells us that there's just one Spirit. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us the Son, or Jesus Christ, will be called the Everlasting Father. 1 Corinthians 8 and 6, there was what but one God, the Father. My, Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10 said, have not we all one Father, and have not one God created us? John 14, 18, Jesus was the comforter. John 14, 26, the Holy Ghost was the comforter. John 14, 23, the Father is the comforter. So who's the comforter? God was the comforter. Jesus was the comforter. The Holy Ghost was the comforter. Because when you talk about one, you're talking about all the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in him. When you say the name of Jesus, you've got the sum total. All that he was was in the man. Who was the comforter? Acts 2, 4 said it was the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, 15 said it was the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God, and it was the Holy Ghost because they are synonymous terms. Next question. I think this is my last question. Does Matthew 28, 19, doesn't it clearly speak of the Trinity in baptism? Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. First of all, the name is singular. We're looking for just one name then. Let's just look for one name. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are not names, they're all titles. That's why Jesus spoke, when he, he would talk, he would say, the Father will come. The Father will send. He didn't call him by name. It was a title. Amen. My son calls me dad, but I'm, that's not my name. That's a title. That's a title. So what was the name of the father? Well, it's an easy one. Jesus said, I come in my father's name. Hebrews said, how did he get his name? He inherited it. It was an heirloom handed down. 
He got his name from his father. What was the name of the son? Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What was the name of the Holy Ghost? Jesus said, I will come again unto you. Not just be with you, but I'm going to be in you. The name of Jesus Christ, according to uh, the book of Acts, when this commandment was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached to those that were ready to obey the gospel message. He said in Acts 2 and 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost did he rebel against the command of Matthew 28 19 you know what's always been humorous to me is people that say well in Matthew it was Jesus words and I'd rather believe Jesus than believe Peter That's some of the goofiest things I ever heard in my life I'd rather believe the words of Jesus than the words of Peter well it's important to notice here that the setting of Matthew 28, 19 is also recorded by two other gospel writers. They use different wording, and yet they were all speaking in harmony uh, to the commandment of the Lord. Luke chapter 24, verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. But Matthew 28, 19 said they were to baptize him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Here he didn't say that. It was the words of Jesus. It's in red too. Mark chapter 16 verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils and they shall speak with new tongues. There's no mention there of being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. No mention of it whatsoever. Because they were all talking about the same thing. Name, one name. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 10, 43. To him... To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Philippians 2 and 9. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There was just one name that had all power and it was the the name of Jesus that's why we baptize in his name because that's the only way they ever baptized was in his name look at this from a historical standpoint I'm closing Bible scholars agree it was in fact it was a fact that in the acts of the apostles in all the examples of baptism only the name of Jesus occurs implying that this was the exact formula used it may be also viewed as a historical summary to the essential fact the name of Jesus stood for the God in flesh who came to bring forgiveness of sins. Therefore, the command of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19 may not be regarded as a formula for baptism. And since immersion alone was commanded by Jesus and practiced in the New Testament times in his name, we have no reason to doubt the formula for this rite. Well, we covered this when we talked about baptism. But in the New Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 2, pages 58, 59, under the subheading of BAA and CAM, it says, and I quote, In regard to the formula used for baptism in the early church, there is a difficulty that although Matthew 28, 19 seems to speak of the Trinitarian formula, which is now used, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 38, chapter 8, verse 16, Chapter 10, verse 48. Chapter 19, verse 5. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Paul in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 speak only of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. It has been proposed that we assume the one being baptized had to confess the name of Jesus and then the minister would pronounce a Trinitarian formula. This remains, however, an arbitrary conjecture or in parentheses, a self-willed guess. 
an explicit reference to the Trinitarian formula of baptism cannot be found in the first centuries. End of quote. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name. Because that's the only way they did it in the scripture. Every time they did anything, they did it in the name of Jesus. It's astounding how many people in denominal churches all over the world, they will pray in his name. They pray over their food in his name. They do all kinds of things in his name, but they won't baptize in his name. They confess his name, but won't be baptized in his name. They use the title Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But we know what the scripture said. Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, he said, you'll die in your sins. I thank the Lord. You may not do it, but I thank the Lord all the time for revelation. I thank the Lord that I know who he is. I thank the Lord for what he revealed to me a long time ago. Not because somebody told me, but somewhere in my, through the years while I studied it, I said it here before, that when my pastor preached it, I had it in my head. I knew it because of what he said. But somewhere when he quit preaching it, I realized it made a transition from my head to my heart. It went from knowing to really knowing. It didn't matter if he didn't preach it anymore. I knew it because I got in the book and found out that God's word is true. He's faithful to his word. I'm glad I know who he is.